if I had two minutes to present Newton to you, this is what I would say. Uh, Newton, the, the man was connected to the universe in ways that no other man was. He discovered the laws of optics. Okay, He figured out that white light is composed of colors. If you take all the colors of the rainbow, mix them together, you get white light again. That, it's kind of freaky. I mean, think about it. It kind of freaked out the artists of the day. How, how does that work? You take all the colors, put them back together, get white again. So he discovered the laws of optics. He discovered the laws of motion and the universal law of gravitation. And then his friend came to him and said, well, wh why are these orbits, why are these um, those orbs, those planets, are, are they in an ellipse shape? Why aren't there any other shape? Well, he said, you, you know, I can't, I don't know. I'll get back to you. So he went home and a couple of, uh, like a while later, he came back and he said, well, here's why. They're actually conic sections, okay? Sections of a cone. If you take a cone and you cut it in the middle, you get an ellipse. And he said, well, how did you determine this? So he said, well, I had to invent integral and differential calculus. Because one different time you think on. Then he turned 25. Then he turned 25. <laughs> we have people slogging through college just to learn calculus. I had to do calculus one twice, and I'm going to do calculus two twice again. Just to learn what it is, and for something that the man practically invented on a dare. So that's my man, Isaac Newton. Sixteen forty three. The man was born in England. Um, <clears throat> by the time he was eighteen, so he joined the the uh, Cambridge University. The Trinity uh, University uh, College of Cambridge, um, age 18. Now, in in that college, uh, they were teaching Aristotle uh, theories, but he preferred the more modern um, uh, modern people like Descartes and astronomers like uh, uh, Galileo, Copernicus, and Kepler. And when he finished his degree in six, 1665. Um, when he was 22. There was a great plague in England. Uh, two years of, of a very, very harsh plague uh, during that time, the university closed for two years, so he went home and he said, well, what would they have teach me if, if, if I was there? So when he was home, he developed two things. The... The binomial theorem, um, a very complex, to that time, mathematical equation, uh, the solution for this, by the times of n, okay? Um, this was a very big breakthrough in mathematics, and also, at that time, from 1665 to 1667, welcome. He developed also... Uh, differential and integral calculus. Now, um, <clears throat> now I want to say, uh, when he was in university, he uh, joined in, um, it's called the Caesar. I'll write it down. It's kind of a work study status in the university. He also worked for his living for accommodation and food, which is kind of <coughs> harder. Okay. Um, after, after 1667, when he invented, also he found the laws of motion, uh, 20 years later, he published his most famous book. It's called
slabs in six times. <coughs> Spent all this. Philosophia naturalis principia mathematica, which means mathematical principles in natural philosophy. This book had the laws of motion, the universal law of gravitation, and basically this is where the first time he published his calculus. Now the thing is, there was another guy named Leibniz, okay? And most historians claim that they both developed calculus, integral and differential calculus, uh, simultaneously, separately. But uh, in Newton's book, uh, the calculus is presented in a very geometrical way, and more of the, how to say, the the using of the calculus and not the calculus itself. And Leibniz said that later on, when he published his articles, that uh, Newton didn't really publish these things first, and it only took until 1704, I think. Uh, for the second edition of this book, to, for Newton to really publish all the laws uh, organized in a very um, arranged way as we know in mathematics today. And 40 years later, Forty years later, at age of eighty-four, he died. <coughs> now, the thing about uh, Newton's discoveries, I think they are the most revolutionary, because, for example, if you take the classical mechanics, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, they stayed applied for. And, and haven't like completely changed for the next 200 years. Okay? Uh, we still use classical mechanics today, and I'll explain what's what. Um, Newton, Newton's mechanics. Every every uh, field of mechanics is divided to four parts. Depends on speed and mass. So if we take Let's call it regular size of mass. Nothing uh, microscopic, uh, very, very small. So... Maybe you change the time. Sorry? Yes? Maybe you change the time. Ah, okay. I'll go from here. So, um, if we're talking about, let's call it regular sizes. And <coughs> speeds of... Also, let's call it regular speed, which is uh, not near speed of light. No. So, classical mechanics, or Newtonian mechanics, explain this part. Now, mechanics um, is basically uh, studying the movements of objects, which is a very, very um, uh, basic and fundamental uh, subject of technology and physics and everything we use today. Now, um, Newton had a little problem. He found that the speed of light is basically this barrier, this threshold that nothing can pass. Now, let's look at the following scenario. He said the, the planets uh, circle the sun and ellipse the orbit because the sun has a gravity and it pulls them towards Earth. So if this is the sun and this is an uh, let's say it's us, we circle the sun like this. And let's say we have uh, this um, fantastic uh, cataclysm. Let's say the sun suddenly disappears. Okay, so because the sun is pulling us towards her, uh, if it disappears, it would stop pulling us. And we'll just, the way we were, start going in a straight line. Now, light uh, takes about eight minutes to travel from the sun to earth. And Newton thought that this kind of force acts instantly. So if the sun disappears, 
we will instantly start moving in a straight line. Now, this was in contra contradiction with his uh, discovery of the, let's say, the threshold of the speed of light. So, he couldn't explain this, and later on there was, uh, I don't know if you know him, it's called Albert Einstein, and he said this. Well, basically, it's not that we're, we circle the sun because it's pulling us towards her. Basically, we're just, the sun is bending the space, and we're moving straight on a bent space. So, it looks like we're circling it. And Albert Einstein managed actually determining and finding that this force is acting in the speed of light. So it would take eight seconds for us to feel the difference. Now let's go back to this. Then Einstein started studying the speeds of light. Okay? Let's call it as well. And he developed, uh, anyone else? Relativity? Motion? Sorry? Longer? Wait, this is speed? Yeah. What did you say? No. Speed of light. Mecha regular sizes in the speed of light. Uh, if I know correctly, that's quantum mechanics. <laughs> and Einstein developed a physical theory that works uh, in the speeds of light. Now, uh, we have also, let's call it tiny sizes. I think Don't it's you the mean opposite. quantum in the tiny? Yeah. This is what I mixed? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I have to apologize, I'm not a physicist, I'm a mathematician. Or at least I'm trying. So, speeds of light, uh, something called relativistic mechanics. Relativistic <laughs> mechanics. Um, this is what we know as the theory of relativity, and this is what Einstein found. And this place, well, I'll just say never mind. Alright. Um, so, I really think that Newton had a very uh, revolutionary uh, impact of our math and, and uh, physics and optics. He was also an alchemist and astronomer. And many of the things he developed, we use today. Even when we uh, send uh, ships to space to land on the moon, and we have to calculate the, their, I don't know, all the, the, the course and everything, we use Newtonian mechanics, classical mechanics. And that's why I think the guy rocks.